Good evening and welcome to Messages of Hope. I'm Jill Lublin, your host tonight, and I'm the author of three best-selling books, Get Noticed, Get Referrals, Networking Magic, and Guerrilla Publicity. Tonight, we're here to talk about women who makes some difference, and a big difference, I might add, internationally and in the States. Tonight, we have Salidra, and she is the founder of a project in Tibet, having to do with yeah. nuns. Yeah. And then I'd also like to introduce Barbara Borden, who is a performer, a drummer, and an entertainer extraordinaire. <laughs> Thank you. So, Salidra, we'll start with you tonight. Okay. And uh, you both have different projects, and we're going to talk about both. But I, I'm interested to know if you'd give us what is going on in Tibet with you. <laughs> well, I would love to start, Jill, with just a short story about what took us to this incredible journey. And uh, it was a year ago, February. I, we designed this Tara Mala. And within days, uh, I was having dinner with my friend Deborah, and she said that Lama Paulden, uh, uh, who runs Sukkot City Foundation, was having a nonprofit at Spirit Rock, and it was in honor of the Nan Chen nuns of Tibet, who I hadn't even heard of. Um, so I talked to Paulden and asked her if we could donate these. And, and these are bracelets? These you are make? prayer beads, actually, mm -hmm. that integrate the spiritual tradition of Tibet with a more modern look and they have the healing gemstones in them as well. So we sold all of them, we donated the money to the nuns and I learned about these nuns for the first time. And these nuns are in Tibet? These nuns are in Tibet and they are actually supported by Sony Rinpoche who supports 3,000 of these nuns in about 30 nunneries throughout the area of Nang Chen. I just fell in love with them. We started a nonprofit sponsored by Marin Link, and uh, I decided, well, I had to go to Tibet. Lama Paulden and I actually came up with this idea to start a self-sustaining cottage industry for these nuns so that they weren't completely dependent upon donations. So I uh, submitted a proposal to Sony Rinpoche, and he uh, granted me permission to go to Tibet. So that was in February, March, around that time. So I was like, okay, we need to have a benefit. We need to be able to get money to go over and make this happen. 14 volunteers uh, volunteers appeared out of nowhere. We put on a benefit in June. We raised $10,000. I mean, I had never even been to an auction. And it was as though all of this was happening on a level that was so much bigger than, than I was. And it was just a very humbling and and um, kind of awesome experience to be in. So you were really the vehicle to bring the gift to the nuns, right? Well, you could say that, but I really think the nuns were the vehicle. And it's, it's like that, um, to me, part of the message of hope is, you know, my prayer was, like, what, are, what am I supposed to do in, in my lifetime? And having this come to me so quickly and clearly, and, um, and I knew it was so much more than, than me that was making this happen. Well, what do you, because you really, for a living, you're a psychotherapist, yes, right? Yes, yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no intention of going to Tibet for my 60th birthday. I was thinking maybe Paris would be nice. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we had this benefit in June, raised the $10,000, and a week later, my friend Jeffrey Jewell, who uh, agreed to be a videographer for the journey, we boarded a plane for Chenning, China. And there we were. We didn't even have an address of where this nunnery was. And it had unfortunately started raining, which makes the roads very treacherous. And to make a long story short, we experienced, for me, the scariest mm -hmm. hours of my life mm -hmm. going up this steep, steep road. Our, our um, elevation was like 13,500 feet. And, um, but we made it. And we made it to this nunnery, Getchak Nunnery. This is a picture of it. There are s between seven and 800 nuns living, in living that. here. And I want to tell you, so such a magical piece of this is it, it took 23 hours the whole Jeep ride to get here. And when we got there and got out of the Jeep, the nun, the head nun, came running down the steps, grabbed my hands, and I felt like she had been waiting for me. And it, it was like that. So these nuns, um, 
as I said, there's seven to eight hundred living in this monastery. It doesn't look like seven or eight hundred people could fit it, in there. They can't, actually. <laughs> Um, we found local Tibetan women who make the prayer beads. We took the prayer beads then and we put them on the altar here at Get Shot Nunnery where uh, Sotnia Rinpoche had requested that they sit on this altar for 30 days to be infused with the prayers and blessings of the nuns. And then our translator Tashi, who became our project manager, sends the malas back to me and then I sell them for $108 and we send mm -hmm. the money back to Tibet and to these nuns. Mm. There are so many nuns in this area of Nongchen that are very impoverished, who have no heat, they have um, very, very um, uh, scarce medical supplies, they don't have electricity. This is a dear nun. She doesn't know how old she is. But I was going to say, how old is she's she? Pretty, she's pretty old. And during the Cultural Revolution, um, so much damage was done to the monasteries and the nunneries, of course, and there is um, the age range between about 40 and 60 where there aren't any nuns, and so many of them were uh, lost during the Cultural Revolution. When you say lost, what do you really mean? Killed? I mean either, yes, killed. Yes, 3,000 nuns were killed in the area of Nanchen alone. Mm. This uh, one beautiful nun right here, um, she hid up in the caves in the mountains, and she survived. She came back to Getchuk, and they are working uh, as much as they can to bring back the monastic life there. Many of these nuns live in three by three foot boxes, and they simply pray. They pray every moment of their days. They, what are they praying for? They are praying. Um, they are praying for you could say the enlightenment of all beings. Mm. They. Their, their every, every moment is dedicated to compassion and love and the healing of the planet. And it's as though they create a vibration that we all feel, no matter who. It doesn't have anything to do with being Buddhist, of course. Yes, well, I'm so glad someone's doing this for us, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We need it exactly. badly. Exactly. <laughs> well, and I'm just curious because, are, are you a Buddhist? You what know, I, you I meditate. Uh. Um, but I don't think it's about Buddhism. It's about compassion and healing. And, um, you know, as the Dalai Lama says, finding that place within us to be happy for no reason. One of the amazing, magical things that happened was that my friend, uh, Jeffrey, who came with me, wasn't really a videographer, but he did a great job. We were sitting there at Getchat Nunnery, and the Rinpoche there, I kept saying, what do you really need? What do you need? What do you need? Well, obviously, seven to eight hundred nuns cannot live here. And he said, we don't even, these women don't even have a room to come and pray together, mm -hmm. which is the foundation of that kind of life, much less have enough housing. And so he said, what we really need is a building. We need a, like a monastery. Jeffrey and I looked at each other. He happens to be a non-profit builder. And it was like that. That was one of those moments, like the the, the heavens the opened heavens up. Heavens opened up, exactly. So we are currently in process, in the process of uh, building the first green monastery. And Sony Rinpoche mm. is so happy, and um, we'll use it as a prototype. So uh, that's something that we're going to be starting with the building market. It's been slow getting going. Uh, but that is our dream and our vision to build a green monastery oh. right there at Getchuk Nunnery. Well, that's a message of hope. That <laughs> is a message of hope. Yes, absolutely, Jill. Yes. Well, Barbara, I, I know yes. that you've been traveling the world and also spreading messages of hope with your drumming, and, and you've just come back from Siberia. Yes, which isn't too far away from where you were in we Tibet. We could have had tea. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> a little gap there. <laughs> and tell, tell me, why were you there in Siberia? What were you doing? Well, I'll tell you the story. I saw a picture with a drum like that, which is a Siberian shaman drum, with a shaman attached when I saw the picture in Mickey Hart's book, Planet Drum. And I saw that picture about 20 years ago, and I just went, ah, you know, one of those moments. And then a friend of mine about a year and a half ago said, I need to get back to Siberia. And my little ears perked up. I said, Siberia? And she had, uh, she's a musician friend of mine local musician here, and she had been to 
a music festival in Abakan Hakasia, which is Abakan is the capital of Hakasia, which is a small republic not far from Mongolia and Tuva. And she said, I've got to go back there. And then I spent 10 days with this wonderful shaman, and I want to go back there. She said, we need to get a band together, and you're having a documentary done about you. And I said, this is perfect, because my roots are Russian. Mm. So I said, we're going to go. And so we did. Similar to you, we raised $10,000 mm -hmm. to get the trip going. And um, the, the documentary that's being done is a nonprofit documentary, so it's all about fundraising, and you know that one. And we went, and we played at this music festival, the mm -hmm. Char Chayan Music Festival, which is um, about um, care of the earth. It's an echo ethnological puppet theater and music festival that happens every two years there. And we marched in a parade with our American flag with the peace sign in the blue part mm -hmm. instead of the stars. And uh, the parade was down the main street of town, and people were decked out in their traditional uh, costume and garb. And it was just an amazing event. Wow. And now, that, if that I lasted may, about 10 days. Yeah, unlike Saladra, mm -hmm. I know, you know this kind of vision, so to speak, came to you. But you've been performing, and, and drums have been your heartbeat for how long now? And my hope. They're my hope, really, mm. too. Uh, all my life, really. I, my first drum came when I was five, uh, although I'm sure I was tapping on things long before that. And, and then my first drum set when I was 10. Wow. Mm. And now I'm much older. <laughs> <laughs> And Many years have passed. And what's been <laughs> happening in between? Like, how do you use the drum for hope, for inspiration for others? Well, it's interesting because I grew up playing drum kit jazz. That was me, big band jazz, all the way through school, college. Then there was a lapse where I tried to be normal and get married and have a day job and all that. That mm -hmm. didn't work out at all. No, I can't <laughs> imagine. <laughs> it was a quick period. <laughs> And then I went back to drumming full force and, and uh, got involved with, it was the feminist period, and I got involved with a women's uh, jazz band called mm -hmm. Alive in the late 70s and 80s and traveled the country uh, doing music and really learning about the more community-oriented possibilities in music rather than, you know, being a superstar or whatever my vision was. and. That took me then to, um, actually when the band stopped, I, I kind of fell apart because I was stunned a bit and didn't know quite what I wanted to do. And I ended up stumbling upon the healing effects of drumming. Tell us about that, because I know one of the things you have is a mother drum, so to speak. Yes. And, and and I, that mother drum got moved. That great big mother drum, the heart drum, is now uh, with a Native American tribe in Suquamish, mm -hmm. Washington. Um, I, I was the message came that the drum needed to move on to this one drum keeper, Susie Hawk. And mm -hmm. the good news is that she's used it for many ceremonies in their tribe. And it will be in Washington, D.C. in October uh, doing a three-day drumming vigil outside the um, uh, Washington Monument for three days uh, for peace. Oh, so, so mm -hmm. for you, drums have always been messages of hope from messages what I'm hearing. Messages of hope and and tools of hope and how um, so can you drum us a little theme about that oh you bet <laughs> <laughs> i love to make things up on the spot so we'll just see what we're going to improvise yes indeed all right 